Hey guys, come here. Dad. Okay, so we are at the very top of this river system. And we are going to take it all the way to the sea. And we'll watch the ecosystem change along the way. I have wanted to make this film for years. <laughs> I'm only going to say this once, so make sure you listen. It is very, very difficult to live in an intertidal zone. These fungi are uniquely adapted to these ecosystems. It's just grass, but it's a lot more than grass. It's an ecosystem engineer. It's the reason our salt marshes exist as they do. But we still know very, very little about these guys. So without the spartinum, you wouldn't have the fungi. And without the fungi, you wouldn't have the spartinum. And without both of them, you wouldn't have the marsh. Sediment settles around it, and it starts to build up and build up and build up, and then mm. more marsh can form and more marsh can form and mm -hmm. more marsh can form. Thank you for uh, being patient with my filmmaking escapades. Of course. Yeah. So this video is an adventure vlog. We'll start here in the Delmarva Peninsula, specifically at the top of a tributary to the Chincoteague Bay called Swan's Gut Creek. We're going to go from the top of the creek where it's fresh water all the way down to the bay where it's salty. And then we'll head back to the lab to take a look at all the fungi that we found along the way. What this film is about is to try to imagine the full scale of living systems. In the beginning, we'll be using drone photography to take a look at the entire marsh, many miles of it. But by the end, I'll be shooting through a microscope so that you can see individual cells. And I'll be talking with my colleague Chris about their relationship to the whole. And then we'll come back here and wrap up. Let's go explore the gut. Yeah. And so we're getting in somewhere over here. And okay. then we're going to paddle down Swan's gut until we get down here uh -huh. into the bay. That's awesome. Yeah. So we're going to go. So we get to see the entire length of the gut. Yeah. Yep. Wow. We'll gut all the way out to the bay. So we are at the top of Swan's gut. Wait, Chris, can you tell me a little bit about... So this is Swan's Gut. It's a tributary. We're technically in Maryland right now, right? It starts freshwater. If you look around at the vegetation here, you'll see a lot of characteristic freshwater vegetation. We're freshwater right now. As we move down towards the bay, we're going to progressively get into saltier water. Our goal here today is to sample Martina at multiple points of different salinity. So I've got a refractometer on me to get the salinity readings. Uh, the students are going to be collecting tissue samples and things like that as we go. I want to get an establishing drone shot right here. If it's okay with y'all for me to fly a drone for like two minutes tops. And then I will join you. Cool with me. Okay. I'll hang, with, I'll hang out with them for a little bit. We want Spartina, to be clear, that is basically as close to the water as you can get. So it's okay? So it's in the water, right? Like if it's partially submerged, even better. Okay? And then after you do that, you get your sample, put your sample in a bag. Labeling is your friend, or your enemy if you do it bad. It's like I'm looking at it and visualizing it. It's a it's situation a ship. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I don't know much, but oh, what I do know is that it is pretty cool that the salinity level is like that, like you can withstand that. How do you think it feels about you picking some of its leaves and looking at its insides for symbionts? I'm pissed as hell, but there's a lot around here. <laughs> pissed as hell? Spartina alterniflora. Here we are. So it grows, its roots are in the water. <sighs> Holy crap, like its roots are way down there. They exude salt crystals because there's so much salt in here and they just, they just like literally poop it out. We're gonna go find site two. We're gonna go under this bridge and a little bit down the way. I'm gonna take a salinity reading of the water and I will report that to you so you can write it in your field notebooks. You should record what you are doing in your field notebooks if you're the person sampling. Chris, can you tell me about why you started this particular research project? Like why you wanted to look at this species of grass and its partners? Bartina alterniflora is like the predominant vegetation in salt marshes. Salt marshes play a really important role as an ecosystem, but they're also very important for us as people because they help buffer coastlines from flooding, events, things like that. The fungi that live associated with Spartina, we know very little about. Some fungi have been documented on Spartina, but in particular, it's a perennial. So it, it gets lush and green this time of year, but all this green will die back as we get into the fall. Mm -hmm. What will be left is these dead little standing combs, old stems. That's what you have in your hands? Yeah, this is what I have in my hands here. A lot of them will break off. You'll find them floating around. They'll form giant mats of rack that you'll see, but there are also gonna be a lot left standing. But what's really interesting about these combs and has always fascinated me is there are fungi all over them. 
there are little, I always tell my students to look for the little black dots, but if you remove some of the caked mud, you can very clearly and easily see the little ascomycotin fruiting bodies that are on here. So yeah, we'll find all sorts of things from this and we'll be able to take them back into the lab and I'll teach the students how to dissect them out under wow. the scope and we'll, we'll try and look at them under the scope. We're also going to try and put some in culture. So the thing about systems like this is that they form these incredible intersections between different environments, right? Because we've got the like farmland up there and there's ocean over there and these grass patches are what you get at the boundary between them and so you get all sorts of different creatures and different points of view. Chris, how did you choose for this to be site 3? I just kind of felt like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just kind of at random choosing sites down the tributary. Okay, cool. Well, here's site three. It's hot. I love it. <laughs> Thanks for driving. <laughs> How's it going, Chris? For here. You got some grass? I wonder what role the combs have in the tide play and dispersion of these fungi. Mm -hmm. When you look at some of the ascospores or the spores that they produce underneath the scope, they're sometimes very ornamented. They have really cool shapes and we have often seen some with like almost like gelatinous sheets around the spore. Okay. That, that makes me think. So they do have macro sexual structures. They're just real fucking tiny. Yeah. Okay. Yep, pretty much. That's <laughs> it. Yep. This tells uh, us literally how all of these different creatures that are living here are interacting with each other and with their landscape, right? Like it's this sort of like primary data, foundational data that can give us an understanding of how the entire ecosystem forms relationships with itself. Everybody have their samples? Okay. Where are we going next? We're going home. We're going home? Going home. So we have finally made it to the sea. Look at that ocean. And so now the ecosystem is radically different and we get to go paddle out into the waves. Gosh, Chinky Cheek Bay is so different from Swan's Gut. <laughs> so different. <gasps> so blue. There's a lot of uh, a lot of questions that haven't been asked. <laughs> For right. sure. Yeah. I want to know if there's any correlation between the fungi we find as endophytes and the salinity. Okay. Like it's kind of almost the low-hanging fruit because we have these nice tributaries like Swan's Gut right. that yeah. kind of cover the gamut of mm -hmm. salinities. But that was a beautiful, beautiful day. Yeah. Beautiful kayak. It's really hot. I just yeah, it's really it fucking hot. Yeah, uh, neither did I. My sunscreen ran into my eyes about halfway down. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, I think it's time for us to go back home. Yep. Field work over. So now we're gonna go back to the lab and the pace of this video is gonna change. We're gonna slow down. I started studying mycology because I love field work. Being out there and seeing all these creatures growing on top of or inside other creatures, it's a good reminder that I'm a creature too. I'm connected to all that and that's a nice feeling. But being in the lab does not <laughs> feel that way, at least for me. Instead of focusing on these big systems that make me feel small and integrated in the lab, I often feel like a big bumbling alien or something. We use a lot of tech to separate out a single part of that system and isolate it from everything that it came from so that we can know what it's like just on its own. That's science and it can be tedious, but Chris is a fantastic guide and there is something quite magical about being able to choose just one single cell out of literally trillions of trillions and to learn its name. Hi, I'm Leptosuria. Nice to meet you. What is the rationale behind all of this? Like, why do you have that grass in front of you? What do you intend to do with it? Yeah, so when we were at Swan's Gut yesterday, mm -hmm. I noticed that a lot of the Spartina growth vegetative group, which should be green and healthy, mm -hmm. was actually covered in necrotic tissue or dead tissue. Okay. On that tissue, it was very clearly fungal infection, mm -hmm. which is evidenced by, like, there's black dots all over the black, the, the black legions and black dots. So those are fungal structures. Right? But we should be able to pull off these little fruiting bodies. We should be able to put them onto a microscope slide. And we should be able to get good imagery of both the spores and where the spores come from, the, the fruit. 
that's cool. going to give us some information for identification purposes. Gotcha. I'm just going to make a slice here. There's lots of little fruiting bodies on here. Mm -hmm. So I take that little piece. So the Spartanum is sort of like the foundational species of these salt marshes. It's, yes. it's the thing the food chain is built off of. Well, not just that. It, like, it builds the soil structure. It, it builds right. the marsh. It without, builds the marsh. The Spartanum, it is the marsh, right. And so understanding the fungi that it is in relationship with is key to understanding how it functions. Exactly. Okay. Cool. So I would consider this probably a plant pathogen. Uh huh. What we're looking at. Here. And this is all salt around here. For the most part, you clearly see some salt crystals. Yeah. So these plants are very salty, but there's little black orbs all in here, and those black orbs are the fruiting bodies. Uh, okay. Uh, they're exposed to the tides constantly. Mm -hmm. Are they adapted to releasing their spores into the bay water? Are they gotcha. Part of, you know what I mean. But I'm thinking what I might just do is chop this guy out and put it on a microscope slide directly. Let's go for higher magnification. I like to do it with a little tiny slivers. Oh, wow. Okay. That's tiny sliver. Mm -hmm. One of the hardest things for people when it comes to basic microscopy is understanding the concept of size and how much you actually need. This is nothing that I just took here, but it's a ton of tissue. Yeah. And it'll become abundantly clear that it's a ton of tissue uh -huh. when I put it under a compound microscope. Capillary action is an amazing thing. So we'll see if that's crushed enough. You can take it over to you and take it off scope now. Cool. I've already got a good view of an ascus and ascus core, so that's promising. So the sacs with the eight ascus spores in each one. There's these really tiny structures. All coming out there, like little fingers. Yeah, yep. those. That's the uh, ascus. The big spheres are the fruiting body. The big spheres are the equivalent of a mushroom. This is a parathesia. Uh, this is a flask-shaped fruity body. Within those, we have acai. That's the acai. Okay, and they each make eight, usually. Yeah, usually eight ascus spores. They're the equivalent, like if you think about it in terms of what a mushroom produces, right? Paradisium is kind of analogous to, to the mushroom. gills. Okay. And yes, the gills as well. Mm -hmm. Quite beautiful ascus spores, actually. Yeah. From the shape and size of the spores, you can get sufficient morphological information to get this to a genus level. Most likely, yeah. Okay, so we're moving from the parasite or the pathogen to the decomposers. Or at least what I'm hypothesizing are decomposers. This is great. This is precisely what the conclusion of the video ought to be. Awesome. <laughs> I'm on the lookout for small black dots. You can probably see some right there. Each of those black dots are what we could say is the equivalent of a morel, some sort of ascomycotin fruiting body. Kind of, yes. The ones that kind of look like they have volcanic craters that have yeah. erupted here. These guys likely have already released their spores. That makes a lot of but sense. But here we have a big dome that mm -hmm. hasn't hasn't cratered yet, essentially. So it's more likely that we'll get some good spores from that. So but. what you want to do is you want to use the razors to isolate that. You're going to put it on a slide and crush it open. Exactly. And then we'll look at the compound microscope and try to see the spores. Okay. Let me look at the glass. It's like it's a sort of a tribute to the front guy. <laughs> you got it. Wow. Here's one of the spores right here. That's a spore. That is an ascospore right there. Got one, two, three septa, kind of tinged with coloration in the middle two cell compartments. And those two cell compartments are thicker than the cell compartments on the outside. It's also got some large bubbles in it, maybe some like oil droplets or something like that. Oh, I see what you're saying about the lipids. Why do you think it's named? Your guess is as good as mine. I don't think that's true, but uh, I'm going to look in the late night and ask for my seats. Let's see. Wow, that's so cool. I would, yeah, it looks just like 78. <laughs> All right, so what is 78 named? Let's find out. Leptospheria of discourse, generally found in bark, bamboo, wood, and spartina. Leptospheria discourse. Yep. Let's talk about it. Recepte, apical cells, so the two small cells, hyaline, middle cells, brown to yellow brown. Broadly fusoid curved, constricted with the septa, so the septa kind of. The cells can't go out. I'll tell you when I tighten my belt. Woo! <laughs> uh, yeah, and that's great. 
Synoptic Plates of Higher Marine Fungi, an Identification Guide for the Marine Environment. This is so cool, Chris. I could spend days just looking at, like, this is, like, like this amount of sample. It's four sites. I probably have, like, five to ten palms per site. Right. And that's, like, probably months of work of just looking at the scope because there are right. so many different fungi on these poles. Okay, so we should not assume that there's just one species eating the one species yeah, of grass. Know, from published literature, we know that there's a lot of fungal species on here. And we also know that a lot of them have not been formally described. I can point to several examples of new species that they describe, new genera that they describe, where they've only been isolated once, or not isolated, but viewed, right. observed once, yeah. and never again. Right. And all the species description that we have is purely morphological. Right. Which doesn't mean it's wrong, but we know with new sequencing technology, yeah. we, we need to know where these things fall within the fungal kingdom. They could be separate species, even if they look super similar. Exactly. So what I'm going to try to do for a lot of these is, in addition to getting scope picks, I'm going to try to grow these in culture. Wow. This usually becomes like a student independent study project. So I'll okay. have a student kind of write a small Harper Edge grant, mm -hmm. uh, get some money for sequencing of these fungi. They'll write the grant, they'll get the money, and we'll be able to fund sequencing Great. of these fungi. Now, well, that will have to be for another episode then. Yeah. Mycology is <laughs> understudied and underfunded, and marine mycology especially so. So there are some very basic questions about like the shape of the tree of life or the evolutionary relationships between fungi and the plants they live on that we just don't know the answers to, even though they're literally all around us. But what that means is that it's surprisingly easy to discover something new. Like we went on that field trip with about a dozen undergraduate students, and it would not be unusual if one of them ended up identifying a new species. It happens all the time, and knowing things named Names is really important, right? Like, you can't have a relationship with someone if you don't know what to call them. So it kind of shocks me just how many biology classes are still taught entirely inside or at lab benches looking at single cells without ever being in the environment that they came from. It's like if I took a dance class where we just sat in a lecture hall and read dance theory, right? Like, life is something that you do, not just study. So learning like this, floating in kayaks surrounded by friends deep in an environment, it's way more effective than any classroom that I've ever been in. So thanks, Chris. Thank you for setting all this up. It's really a dream come true, and I'm very excited to keep teaching with you and learning with y'all. I don't think you can do one without the other. Never. Because, you know, without the marsh grass, there'd be no fungi, and without the fungi, there'd be no marsh.